Hi, and welcome to Faith, Art, and Tiny Houses. I'm your host, Carmen Shank. Hello, friends. Today I want to weave you a Mennonite tale. First of all, I have a beautiful project on the loom right now. The colors are inspired by a peacock feather and I am absolutely loving how it's coming together. Secondly, I have picked up a book, A Modest Mennonite Home, The Story of the 1719 Hans Hare House, an Early Colonial Landmark by Steve Friesen. And I have absolutely fallen in love with the story. And this is a house built by my eighth great grandfather. And so I was really happy to run across this book uh, online. I, I kind of came across it by accident and then you bet I snapped up a copy in a hurry. And so I have read this week about my Mennonite history, my Mennonite heritage, and how it was born out of the Reformation and all of these different groups uh, the Moravians, the Mennonites, the Hutterites, the Amish, the Old Order Mennonites, the, uh, who am I missing, the Quakers, the, all that. I mean, this is a really uh, spiritually convoluted story. I mean, I think there's, a, there's such a thread of grace through this whole thing, such a thread of grace. So come along for the ride today. I'm going to do this in two parts. First, today I will talk about Mennonite history. And then the next episode, I intend to talk a little bit about my response to that history. What is it that we have learned in the last half century since this Mennonite thing was born? What are some of my takeaways? And um, what are some of the ways that I am Mennonite and the ways that I don't really consider myself as Mennonite? <laughs> So stick around. I am delighted to have you along for the ride. Hello, friends. I've been studying one of my ancestors. His name is Hans Herr, and he was born in Zurich, Switzerland, and he died in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And he is my eighth great grandfather. So in the process of learning more about him and the house that he built in Pennsylvania, I picked up this book, A Modest Mennonite Home, and I've absolutely been captivated by the story. So they took a German house, or the way Germans um, lived, and took that whole experience and basically just copied it when they got to Pennsylvania. And it's really, really interesting to learn about the house and how it was constructed and all of its different features. But it was also interesting to go back and learn more specifically about my Mennonite heritage. And so I wanted to share a little bit of that history with you. I don't know if you're aware of these. I mean, there's all kinds of things like Mennonites, Quakers, uh, Moravians, uh, Old Order Mennonites, Amish. There's a whole like group of um, group of people, group of subcultures, and they're each fascinating in their own right. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a taste of where that came from. So in 1517, Martin Luther took his thesis of 95 points and nailed it to the door of the church in Wittenberg in Germany. And he was excommunicated because they don't like people nailing things to their doors and because his ideas were radical <laughs> or perfectly logical, depending on your perspective. And so Luther um, got excommunicated and turned to the Prince of Saxony for protection. And... Um, other dissatisfied rulers kind of joined in and became a whole movement. In the midst of that, as you can imagine, there's always people who want to change the church from the outside and people who want to change the church from the inside. And one of those people who wanted to ch change the church, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, who wanted to change it from the inside was a man named Ulrich Zwingli. Cool name, right? And so he became the leader of the most interesting part of the Reformation, and that is the Anabaptists. He was, um, he lived in Zurich as the people's priest, and he began to do some reforming of what was taught in that community. Like Luther, he taught salvation by grace, 
He advocated the marriage of priests, which I think is a good thing. <laughs> he rejected transubstantiation in the Mass and practiced an open Lord's Supper using bread and wine. And he went further than Luther in some respects, rejecting the use of music and other fine arts in the church and in the worship service. And that's, um, I have mixed feelings about that. My husband's a pipe organ builder. I'm an artist and a musician. And so naturally I'm like, all of that stuff belongs in the church. However, I believe some of those things were a reaction to what was happening in the church which may be um, in those cases where they were building these cathedrals over hundreds of years and they were putting the resources into building the cathedrals instead of feeding people who were hungry. So I can see how that would be a problem. <laughs> I think people need food, <laughs> crazy like that. Uh, the early Anabaptists didn't have churches, church buildings, so that wasn't really an issue. It was more of a, um, a reaction to the, the Ro Roman Catholic, um, the whole Roman Catholic arts and crafts, people's Bible kind of thing. In January 1525, Zwingli and Conrad Grable took part in a ma major debate on the issue of baptism, and Conrad Grable... Um, argued for believers' baptism, which led to an interesting thing on January 21st, 1525. A group of people got together and baptized each other. They were adults. Up until that time, uh, they only baptized babies. The child in question didn't have any say in the matter, and it was tied to citizenship. And that's how this specifically religious concept was so tied to uh, the rulers of the region. So anytime you start messing with things like citizenship and who is and who isn't a part of this group, things get a little bit tricky. So that began the persecution of the Anabaptists. The word Anabaptist does not mean anti-baptism. What it means is rebaptizers. Uh, so the people were baptized as infants because that's how you became a citizen. And then they decided for believer's baptism, which was an adult who had made a decision to follow Jesus, would then be baptized. So they were re-baptizing. And that's how we get the word Anabaptist. The three most basic ideas of the movement were First, the Anabaptists rejected infant baptism in favor of believers' baptism of adults. Secondly, they advocated a separation of church and state. Third, most Anabaptists refused to take up the sword to defend themselves or the state, practicing instead the words of Jesus to turn the other cheek. So these ideas had political ramifications, as you can imagine, and so persecution of Anabaptists began. The uh, first martyr was Aberly Bolt. He died in the spring of 1525. He was burned at stake. Shortly after that, Hans Krutzi was executed in Lucerne, and then Felix Mons became the first Anabaptist killed by Protestant authorities when he was drowned in Zurich in January of 1527. So unfortunately, what followed then was thousands of people died. They were um, thrown in prison, tortured, and killed during the Reformation. Unpleasant, really unpleasant time in the life of the church, but it was refining fire. Um, as people died, their, um, you know, the stories, I've read some of the, of the Martyr's Mirror, which is a book from that era that details the deaths of those folks. And the stories are amazing. I mean, um, it was not uncommon for there to be a note, you know, so-and-so was burned at the stake and his face had a holy glow and that kind of thing. So there were, there were horrible things happening to people and the church was growing because they were seeing the intersection of heaven and earth at this point of death. And it was touching people.
Interestingly enough, when the Mennonites were fleeing persecution, they fled into Moravia. And that was the only area where they were greeted um, peacefully. And so um, I think there's still a close connection to this day between the Moravians and the Mennonites. The, uh, the community, the, the, the community of the Moravians was not crazy about the Mennonites, but because the Moravians were so good at farming and making sure people had food to eat, <laughs> it seemed a bad idea to upset them. So the Mennonites and the Moravians were closely connected in that era. I think that's pretty cool, actually, because Xavier and I have friends who are Moravian, and that's kind of, that's really kind of a neat connection. In 1528, there was a group of Anabaptists who were kicked out of Nikolsburg, and they basically got together, put a couple of blankets on the ground, and everybody just chucked in everything they owned, and they became, they began to live in a communal fashion, and those folks are called Hutterites to this day because they were following Jacob Hutter. And so it's interesting that how out of the Reformation, people who stepped up and had something to say, these groups became known by those names. In the 1690s, a group of Mennonite churches in Alsace, near today's French-German border, became to believe that other Mennonites in southern Germany weren't doing it right in <laughs> southern Germany and Switzerland. This group was led by Jacob Amon, and he believed that uh, if somebody was screwing up and was behaving badly, that the group should shun them, and that this should be done enthusiastically, and that there should be more separation between this group and the outside world. And his name was Jacob Amon, and so that group became known as the Amish, after Jacob Amon. So during that season, the leaders were martyred, and the communities were driven into the countryside. They could live a little bit more freely with the less fear if they lived in the country. So to this day, Mennonites are agrarian people, so I kind of get that. I get how that happened, so they turned to farming. In 1635, Zurich began a very purposeful um, campaign to throw everybody out of the canton or county that was Anabaptist. So they basically went door to door and kicked you out if you were Anabaptist. So <laughs> from that, a group of people went from Zurich to the Palatinate in Germany. And a generation later, then a lot of them were moving, another third of them were moving to the States. In 1677, William Penn traveled through the Palatinate area of Germany, preaching in Worms and Crookshire. And some of the Mennonites joined the Quakers as a result. And part of what he was talking about was the beauty of this brave new world. And he was talking about what would become Pennsylvania, William Penn, Pennsylvania. And so he invited various people to join him in the new world. And that's how a large group of those Swiss German folks ended up in Pennsylvania, and some also in the Carolinas. But for the most part, those folks made the big move across the pond to Pennsylvania. And that's where we come to Hans Herr. And he moved in 1709. And he moved to an area that became Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Now, that is still a community of a lot of Mennonites. There's a pocket in Ohio and a pocket here in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And, you know, there's pockets of Mennonites here and there. Um, but it's really been interesting to learn more about how that transition happened between the old world and the new. I thought it was really interesting that the author made the point that the Mennonites of the 18th century were less isolated and less visibly different in relation to the surrounding communities uh, than the, um, our current cultural Mennonites and Amish. Uh, Mennonites, old order Mennonites and Amish look very different from dominant culture. 
And it wasn't that way in the 18th century. There was a lot more, they had a lot more in common back then, which I think is really interesting for that sort of thing to emerge for the, um, for the dress, for the, um, for the really old school ways. So between 1872 and 1901, there was another group of divisions between and among the Mennonites, which there was one group that thought that the service should all be done in German. The other group thought they should be conducted in German and in English. And the, the, the one group th thought, you know, things are getting too modern. There's too much change. There's revival meetings. There's Sunday school. There's stuff like that. None of that. None of that change should be happening. And so that began the group called the Old Order Mennonites. Now those are the folks that drive the buggies and have the horses and uh, don't have a lot of electricity and that kind of thing. Very similar in appearance to Amish, depending on where you are. Uh, when I lived in northern Indiana, the folks there who uh, drove horse and buggies, they were Amish. Here in Virginia, the folks that drive horse and buggies are Old Order Mennonites, so they're two different things. But So that was a splinter group of the Mennonites who wanted less change wanted to um, assimilate into American culture less, not more. So that became the Old Order Mennonites. So that's a little bit of a taste of Mennonite history. I've enjoyed this journey because it helps me every time I learn more about myself, more about where I come from, more about the people who gave up a lot and who were resilient, who uh, somehow managed to survive seeing thousands of people martyred for their faith. They made it through somehow. And, and I'm really blessed to be a descendant of people who had strong convictions and who really worked at keeping their faith as a central aspect of their lives. And we as Protestants have a lot in common with those early Anabaptists. Uh, one of the things that's different about Mennonites than, say, Baptists and some other groups is the fact that they are, um, they believe in peace and justice, and so they don't go to war, they don't fight, they are peaceful and non-resistant. So that takes a lot of courage to believe something different than dominant culture tells you is acceptable, and so hats off to those folks. And seeing as how it's getting a little bit loud in the neighborhood, I should probably take this opportunity to sign off and um, talk more soon. Thank you so much for joining me today. There is more information about my tiny house experience in the description. You can find a link there to my Faith, Art, and Tiny House podcast playlist, which is which this episode is part of. You can also find my Being and Becoming Me vlog, where I talk about my journey. And also there is a Smart, Sexy, Small House vlog uh, playlist. I'll spit the words out eventually. And that is just talking about some of the really cool projects that we have around the house here. Uh, and we live in 660 square feet. I like to think of it as the house after the tiny house, but this space has enough room for us and our businesses. So we still live kind of tiny in the sense that we have a two bedroom house. I am standing in one, it's not a bedroom, it is a, a weaving studio. And the other one is my husband's office and we treat the rest of the house like a tiny house. So my living room has a Steinway concert grand and a bed side by side. So yeah, we do weird pretty well, so <laughs> stick around. I would be happy to have you. And I wanna just close with one thing. Um, God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you rest and peace. And may your coming and your going be in the full acknowledgement of God's presence with you and in you. Don't give up. Today is no day to give up. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. You can follow me on Instagram at Carmen Rose Shank. You can subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Please do. And you can download us on iTunes. Theme music by classical guitarist Jonathan Crispin. Show notes available at CarmenShank.com.